Hi everybody, um, <clears throat> sorry it's taken a few days extra, um, for those of you that know me I'm not the most um, technically gifted person when it comes to producing videos and things like that, hence why it took a little bit of time, um, I actually did the subject that I was going to do today which is the 2001 World Championships in Paris, I did it but I managed to babble on for just over an hour and for some reason the file just won't send so I've got to condense it a little bit um, but by no means rush it whatsoever so we've done 1998 obviously we had a couple of world championships but on to Paris 2001 um, and it was built up to be the world championships of all world championships obviously fishing in um, the capital of, of, of France um, on a river you know, I think there was about 40 teams, 38, 40 teams. Um, I've done a little bit of research, and again, my father hasn't let me down on the on the memorabilia. I've got some fantastic pictures to share with you. Um, and obviously, like I've already said, my, my memory is very good where fishing's concerned. Um, and, you know, to go back over the results and over the tactics and everything that we did, that's all in the in the paper cuttings that my dad's got here was fantastic and it just sort of showed me just how good my memory actually was so 2001 came along preparing for Paris um, I've got loads of different floats for rivers from from census and various other companies that that look after me that way um, and the preparation levels were even though it's hard to say more than a normal world champs but it was a type of fishing it was a fast deep you know, powerful river, um, and the sort of, the information we got was that it was going to be very, very difficult, some bleak, odd roach, odd perch, odd bream, um, and an odd weird and wonderful fish that's in there, catfish, and eels weren't really mentioned at this time, but catfish, odd carp, even tench, um, so like all the previous world championships, we travelled out there for two weeks. And what was nice was it wasn't the other end of, of Europe for a change. It was literally over on the tunnel, two, two and a half, three hours later, we were there. And we stayed just out of town or out of the city centre um, in a small hotel, a Campanile. It was myself and Stevie travelled together, Bob and Sean and Alan and, and um, Stu Conroy. It was Sean's first year. It was actually the year where Kim bowed out of everything um, and Sean got his chance. And what was nice was basically the management said, Mark Addy, Mark Downs, Dick Clegg as well. Um, basically what they said was was that, um, you know, the five that are going and now Sean's going in Kim's place. So the five um, from the original team, Sean's first year, we're going to fish the first day and Sean will step in the second day. And that really opened the window to a fantastic two weeks practice. I'm not saying that people keep anything back, but when you're fishing against your teammates for a place in the team, it has been known in the past, odd people, no one that's in the setup now certainly does it, but things have been kept back. And also that competition side of it in the squad, personally, I don't think is good. So what was good, we got the green light to go and actually practice. And, you know, Stevie, Bob, Alan, that had fished a lot of these powerful rivers over the years, it probably wasn't so important. And at the time, I didn't realise exactly what I'd learnt that, those two weeks or a number of things that I'd learnt. But that's something that we can go on to in a bit. There's one particular day where something really stood out. And I, I learnt... Not knowing at the time, but I learnt more in probably 10 minutes about river fishing, pole fishing, deep rivers, powerful rivers with big floats. And I could have learnt in a year probably fishing on my own. But um, like I say, we went for two weeks. The first week was spent right opposite um, the Notre Dame. We had a fantastic week's practice, caught some big fish. And it was Stevie who originally tried... Bearing in mind back then you weren't allowed to cup any bait and everything had to be thrown. And one afternoon Stevie tried um, throwing in some chop worm in soil, caught a big eel. And I remember in this, um, like a fishing stand behind us, they put it in a tank for a couple of days and then released it. And it was like a good two, two and a half pound eel. And straight away then we were thinking, hang on a minute, we could be onto something. And in that 
unofficial practice week, we really came out of it thinking, you know, it's very, very difficult, yes, but this chop worm method with a big flat float, Stevie christened it Big Bertha, um, and it, any of you that have got any of the information will see it referred to in the manager's diaries and the tactics side of it as Big Bertha, um, which was a big flat float, stationary right over your bait you're throwing five or six big balls of soil as big as you could make them with one hand and as hard as you could make them and just sit there two pieces of worm not messing around 025 mainline 020 022 hook length size 10 size 12 drennan animal hooks black hydro elastic then um, remember that was one of the first years black hydro sort of really came to the fore and hydro elastic as 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 you know being used in top top high profile matches i think people have just really seen how good the elastic is so after the official practice week obviously we're into um oh sorry after the unofficial practice week obviously we're straight into the official week and like i say i'd caught a 15 16 pound catfish in the unofficial week i'd caught a 12 pound carp Stu conroy had caught a six pound tench and we were all hooking these big fish but one thing that we made clear to the management when they joined us on the Saturday before the official week was that we felt like there was going to be a lot of people on the bank, a lot of people watching, and we need to keep this particular method um, uh, an edge, so to speak, you know, under our hats. We had to try it now and then one person. And because we were practicing, it was a necessity for everyone to sit there and do it and fish against each other. Um, it was just a case of proving its effectiveness on the match length. And like I say, the match length actually ran all the way through, or, or a big part, of the Paris city centre. And like I've already said, we, we were literally three or four miles away from the, the, the river. Um, but some mornings it could take you an hour and a half, hour and three quarters. And some afternoons, if you left the venue a bit earlier to go back to the hotel to tie some hooks or, or redo some rigs or elastics you could literally it was literally like central london just have a little sip of my coffee so like i say the official week came round uh, i remember the first day as if it was yesterday because we were actually on this real high high bank that had steps going down in areas and it was like a wave going along and they put this metal jetty in to make it all one level and obviously you know, Stevie being, um, Stevie can't actually swim, um, which is amazing. You know, someone that spent a massive proportion of his life around, around water. But, you know, and immediately Stevie was like, I, I don't like this. And to be honest, I've never really been afraid of heights. I can swim okay. But it was quite daunting. You were four meters off the water i remember the first day when we practiced on the monday literally i had about eight inches of my net in the water four meter net didn't actually matter because i didn't really catch a lot the first day i think sean was top the first day with about 40 bleak um and stevie actually ordered a flotation suit from the local tackle shop and we never went back to pick it up and we've often joked that if we do go back it will probably still be in the window of this tackle shop with a reserve sign on it but very good times, good, good memories. But one thing that became apparent as the week went on was, you know, we had blanks in practice and this, that and the other. But what became apparent was there were quality fish in a lot of areas. In most pegs, if you fish this chop worm method, you could get a bite either from an eel, a big perch, a big roach sometimes. Um, but also running through... On lighter flat floats, like 8, 10, 12 gram. And bearing in mind on the river saying there's lots of locks, there's lots of tributaries, and the flow would, it would never stop. You know, you'd always need a 10 gram flow, 8 gram, probably the lightest. Um, but it would vary. One minute to hold it still, you'd need 50 grams. The next minute, 30 grams. So it's a case of preparing rigs. I remember most days I had six to ten rigs set up on top fives top sixes was using the 410 darwa tournament pole then awesome bit of kit so strong and it just just never let me down not just there but but ever and still in my mind one of the 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 best all-round poles darwa's ever produced fantastic bit of kit but 
going back to what I said at the start of this video was about learning things and you know anglers watching this that have fished at a high level will appreciate what I'm going to say is you know you, you can see something take it on board and do it without really realizing exactly what you're doing without analyzing it and going over and over and over it you can literally sometimes have a glance and see something start doing it and then the next time you go fishing you're doing it just naturally but this one particular day and i'm sure it was a tuesday i've racked my brains but we're all sat down and we're fishing and stevie was above me and mark downs was behind me and he said what size float you're on and i think say 10 grams and I was running it through, and my float's going through, and he shouted up to Stevie, who by this time had had a big roach and a bream. What size float you on, Steve? And Steve said exactly the same size. And Mark said, well, your float's going through completely different to Will's. Mine was at more of an angle when I was holding it back, and Stevie was running through more, you know, sat straight how you want it to be when you want to present your bait properly. And bearing in mind, you only had three hours to get a handful of bites on this river. You had to be doing it right. But this is where practicing as a team really comes into it. Mark said, put your pole down and go and sit with Stevie. Talk to him. I want you to be putting your float through how he is, because that's why he's had a couple of bites. And no one else at this stage had actually caught. I think Alan had had a big perch. Um, so literally, perfect. Doesn't matter what you weigh in. Doesn't matter what you catch. It's what you're going to learn for the weekend so gone back to my gone gone up to stevie's peg put my pole down gone up sat behind stevie and immediately i could see blimey your every run through it looks like you're you're going to get a bite because you're fishing you know you can tell that his bait was just tripping along the bottom and maybe mine where i'm holding it and it's all coming up and so he bought his rig in again showed me and I said, yeah, your bulk's lower down. Your droppers are definitely, definitely bigger. Went and got my rig that I'd been fishing with, bought it up, and literally carbon copied it. You know, took a couple of the shots off, like bigger droppers, two bigger droppers, moved the bolt down. I think Stevie was on a foot hook length. I was on a 10-inch hook length, so I borrowed a hook length off of Steve. You know, like, done it all like that. Shot it up in the edge, made sure that it's absolutely perfect. Gone back, plumbed up again with a clip-on plummet now on my bottom shot, gone in, whole hook lengths on the bottom, second run through, I've caught a pound roach. And immediately it was like, boom, the lights have turned on. And just knowing in your angling brain and in your, you know, the gut feeling that, yes, my float is going through dead right, no, it's not going through right. And the anglers watching this will know, you know, sometimes you put your rig in and you're just like, that's going to go under. And it does. And other times you put your rig in and think, mm, no, nah, that's just not going through right. And you lift it out and put it in again and start again. So there was a lot of lessons learned, not just with size of droppers, where to position your bulk, how far over depth to fish, how to plumb up properly, but where to feed, where to put your rig in. You'd feed at like one o'clock, put your rig in at 11 o'clock, hold it, let it all straighten out and then just let it go onto your bait. And needless to say, the next day, I think I caught 18 or 19 big roach. Um, I was second to end, and we all caught a few more fish. But I remember that day, packing up, thinking to myself, I'm on this. I, I, I'm, I, I've, I've clicked with this. Not only were we catching odd bleak. Now, you could catch odd bleak everywhere, but it was apparent in a close to 40 peg section that a, ham, a lot of people were going to catch a handful of bleak so to get up there in your section top 10 you know you're going to need to catch something other than a bleak so it is of paramount importance to get your rig running through right and more importantly on those venues is to get your confidence levels up it's so important there's nothing worse than going into like a three-hour match and not being putting your float in thinking well that's not going to go under you needed to run it through every single car thinking to yourself that's dead right there's a fish there i'm going to catch one and it was almost a sense of achievement of getting a bite hooking a fish landing it when other teams around you and some of the england anglers just weren't catching fish but again going back to the practicing i started drinking these 
double espresso coffees in a can and they're even more addictive than the normal coffee so it's um really nice but with the practicing you know we could all practice putting our rigs in right you know fishing big bertha was 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 i wouldn't say easy but once you plumbed it up right you got your rest in and your float was big enough or too big it was fishing and you would get an odd odd bite on this so the practice week continued uh, it was Stu conroy's first year um he'd fished europeans and this that and the other but it was his first time in the world team um and he did fantastic all week and funny little bit of a funny story going back to the unofficial week i actually hooked a big catfish and it started going off downstream and i just thought to myself i'm not getting broke by this and we'd lost some big big fish you know it turns out now you know there's massive catfish in there ridiculous size and i actually got off my box and walked down the river and about 100 yards below us there's this massive bridge um big gold lines on it experts on on you know french or 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 paris um landmarks and that could probably tell me exactly what it is but at the time it was only the fishing that mattered you know you had galleries and notre dame and this that and everything around you and the only thing that mattered was the fishing the blinkers were on it was a hotel or the river and that was it but stuart actually netted this fish for me and and it was a bit of a angling feat between us and it's just just fantastic memories about 15 or 16 pound i know i've got a picture somewhere of it can I find it? No, I can't. But that's for maybe for another day. But fantastic. But it just shows you the sort of fish that were in there. And all the way through the official practice week, um, one of the management would say, right, I want you to have the last 40 minutes on Big Bertha. You'd throw in five or six balls. And nearly all the time, the person that was picked to do it would hook a fish, an eel, a big perch various other fish so as you can imagine now we're going into the weekend we've got you can catch some bleak shallow if you want just running through another method which is something that we employed right at the start and we decided that just to take the pressure off if you can catch a fish a bleak and just put it in your net and then start fishing on the bottom for these bigger fish either on a normal running through flat float or round float depending on the flow this foot over depth, getting it running through right, all Big Bertha. Um, then, you know, like you were more settled. There's nothing worse than sitting there sort of blanking. Um, so we had this method of fishing like a two gram, three gram round bodied float, a metre off bottom. And when you first balled it in, obviously you had a bit of activity off your bait and that. And there was quite often a few bleak to be caught. Just this metre off bottom, just drop your rig in and run it through, double blood worm. And virtually every day you could catch one, two, five or six if you wanted to. But one was really the target. Um, so the weekend comes round. Obviously Sean's not fishing the first day. We had a good week's practice. The Italians, to memory, were doing really, really well catching roach. But we did feel that, you know, come the match day, it was going to be a lot harder. And maybe they just followed, been on some good areas and followed the fish around. They're all fantastic anglers. But we just felt by what we'd caught and what the French had caught and, and the Hungarians, various other teams, that, you know, maybe the Italians have followed some fish around, been near an end and, you know, maybe not such a good team on the end and they've drawn the... But it's all by the by because come, up, come the Saturday, um, now there was one section, I think it was D section, where the river split on an island where Notre Dame is. And so you had A, B, D and E on the massive, big, wild river Seine. And then this middle section, C, was like on a half river. And it went round this bend and it was massive high walls behind you on the river Seine. Concrete bank going down. Each competitor was given like a four and a half, five metre net so that your fish are okay. Um, and I actually drew this one on, on the first day. Obviously, it was slightly, slightly shallower and a little bit less flow. And the plan was to ball it in. Um, we only really had one line. You bolo, the pegs were too close. Slider, it was flowing too fast. You couldn't really catch in close. Because as on a lot of these rivers, there's debris and there's stuff that's been thrown in. Um, so you really just had this long line. 
But personally, I was ultra confident of catching these roach, perch and big bertha. I'd caught some fish on through the week and bleak and that. So I literally started for a bleak on the first day, threw in about 18 and 19 big balls, joker, casters, tiny, tiny bit of chop worm and a few dead pinkies. Started a meter off bottom, immediately caught two or three bleak and thought, right, I'm not, I haven't blanked, put that down. Went in on about a six gram float here, bearing in mind it's narrower, half the flow. And it was about 20 minutes in and it's gone under and I've gone boom. And I've looked a big roach, about 10, 12 ounces, landed that. Fantastic. Sean was my runner this day, coupled with my dad who never really gets it wrong when he's, he's running for me. In the 20 odd years I've been fishing at, at world level, he's run for me on all but one. And um, he's got it absolutely bang on. <coughs> Excuse me. So the plan then, once I caught this roach, there was hardly anything being caught. Started fishing for bleak. Probably caught, I think I caught about 18 or 20 bleak. And then it came to a three hour match. So it came to the last 40 minutes and Sean came along. So I've been on the radio, go on Big Bertha. And that's exactly what I did. A few balls of ground bait were uh, soil were introduced with chop worm. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. I dropped my rig in. I think I was on about 15 gram flat float. We had floats for all sizes, shapes and coloured tops. Whatever you can imagine, we had it made up. Because the variation of flow, not just from section to section, but from, you know, 10 minutes to 10 minutes to 10 minutes, it changes all the time. You needed to just pick up a rig and just swap and change. The level never changed because it was such a big river. But the flow did alter. So I've thrown in... Put my pole in the rest, 14 and a half metres then, I've thrown in six or seven big balls of Ted River full of chop worm, thrown them in, big berth or mini big berth has come out, two inch and a half bits of a dendra, dropped it in, and like I say, I can remember, and after about 10 minutes, I'm sat there and it's just gone, I thought, I don't believe it, and it's gone under, count to three, whack, and I caught, a, I would have thought it was seven or eight ounce perch. Obviously, on that sort of tackle, it's just, you know, you just ship in, net in. But again, I'm thinking that's a bonus because, you know, again, it's hard to say because a river that seemed full of fish, albeit not many, you didn't need a big weight. Kilo, kilo and a half was obviously going to be good. And then the turning point of afterwards, I realised that it probably cost me winning the the world championships individually but with about 10 15 minutes to go i've got another bite and it's just the classic like eel bite it's just gone down and down and one two three whack and whatever it was it was definitely a bite but it snagged solid on the bottom i've tried all sorts trying to get it out personally i think it was an eel that had gone into a snag or or back down a hole or a crack or something it's living in on the bottom Snagged me absolutely solid, pulled for a break, new hook length on, went in, never had another bite. Um, I actually ended up 8th in the 40 peg, or 38, 39 peg section. I actually ended up 8th, which was a fantastic result. Uh, the first day, I think Alan was 14th, he drawn end peg in the match and caught one roach. Which, you know, was a fantastic result. Uh, Bob was 9th, uh, like I say, I was 8th, Stevie was 7th. And I think Stu was 11th. Um, fantastic result. I think we totaled 45 points, something like that. And that was fourth after day one. And a lot of people would be thinking, fourth, oh, blimey, you know. But we were only seven and a half points behind the winners, which I think was Italy on the first day. Um, and... You know, to say that we were confident going into the second day, because the one thing we didn't want to do was have a day one disaster. Um, and the second day, we knew that we'd probably be spending more time on Big Bertha. So team meeting, meal, go to bed, up the next morning, mixing your ground bait up, everything's good. Gone to our pegs. <clears throat> I remember us thinking, yeah, we've got not a bad draw, although my peg had blank, but we didn't take a lot of notice of that because... You know, different anglers, different tactics. A lot of people weren't catching a lot, so we didn't really pay any attention to this. But basically, the match started the same. Balled it in, 
Got my big berthers, my running through rigs, a couple of bleak rigs, and I dropped it in second chuck. I caught a nice big bleak about a metre off bottom, and I thought, that's done. I need to, we need to do really well in some sections if we're going to win this. And again, there's so many... There's so many things in my angling career that just seems like it was yesterday. I could literally shut my eyes and I'm there. And after about 50 minutes, I'd caught one bleak. And I was running this flat float through about 12 grams, running it through. And I'm thinking, that looks bang on. And Dick Clegg came up to me. He said, uh, what hook bait you on? I said, oh, six blood worms. He said, do me a favor, bring that in and put four blood worms and a red maggot on. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like Dick Clegg, you're not going to argue with him. Shipped my pole in, put a red maggot on, four bloodworms, dropped it in. It went about a metre and just went straight under, and I've gone whack. And it's like, woof, woof. and I, immediately I thought, I know what that is, that's a bream. Because we caught a few bream in practice. I dropped my pole down because it went out into the flow. And we had this, um, we were using like a number eight, I think it was a point one Milo crept on pure uh, latex elastic on our running through rigs. 010 and a 16, 6, 6, uh, 6110 uh, sensor hook, real light hook but strong. And I can remember Dick going on the radar, Will's just hooked a big fish. And I'm like, oh my God. And the crowd behind you on this wall was just immense. Hundreds and hundreds of people. A lot of English fans came over. Obviously my dad and certain other people. Mark Eves was behind me. Um, and... I literally lifted my pole up and the tip, and there's about a metre and a half of elastic out, and I can see my stomp foe just doing this in the... And I was like, oh, my God, please stay on. And I got it in, and I've got top six in the air, and I can see this bream now. It's about three and a half pound, and it's literally just turning under the... Right, just out of reach of my landing net, and it's blowing a gale, and had these big willow trees behind me. And anyway, it went in the net, and it was just such a surreal feeling. You know, I'm sat here in the World Championships in Paris with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spectators. And I haven't got a worry in the world because I'm in the top three of the section now. Anyway, if not, going to win it with that one fish. Little known to me, that one fish did actually win my section. But I then went on to Big Bertha. Um, literally... Dick Clegg said to me, look, you know, you caught a bream, you're going to be in the top three. I'm going to go concentrate on the people that might not be doing so well. He said, just go on big. And I said, well, I'm going to get half hour running through because I might catch another bream or a big roach. Did that, no bites. Six or seven balls of Ted River were introduced with chop worm. And I went on to Big Bertha. And what happened next was quite funny because I hadn't had a bite. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know, I'm going to feed again. I'm going to, you know, poles in... Like the gentleman's rest, we used to call it. it it's like your, your front bar and it's wedged in. It's not going anywhere. And your float's sat there all nice, just bobbing about in the fly. And I'd not had an indication. And I thought, right, I'm going to chop some worms up and feed again. I'm going to attack it because I'm, I'm going to be in the top two or three of the section anyway. And I'm cutting these worms up. And there's all the hum of the crowd behind you. And I've heard, Will, Will. And I'm like, who's calling me? I head down, carried on chopping these worms. Like, well, and I've looked round, and Mark Eve's head stuck over this wall, and he's gone, "Your pole." And bearing in mind, by this time, for probably two or three minutes, I'd not looked out there. I'm just chopping some worms up, getting my so And I've looked, and my pole is bent right round, and I've picked up two pound eel. Fantastic. Fed again. I ended up catching five eels, a big perch that bring five kilo, one hundred. Won the section and actually won the match outright the second day. Um, the second day, I was first. I believe Stevie was second. Bob was ninth again. Stuart won his section. Uh, he had just over a kilo of bleak on this high, high section. Did fantastically well. He'd had a first and a, an 11th, I think. I think he was 15th overall that year on his first world champ. So, awesome, awesome result. And that's probably why he became one to be... Ranked world number one for a, a couple of years. Um, I think Alan was sixth, caught mainly bleak, close to where I was the first day, and Bob was ninth again. Absolutely brilliant result, totaled the points up, and we won the world championships. But it wasn't without its controversy. Stevie had had a complaint put in 
about him, about an eel going out of his zone, and no one could make their mind up if it did or it didn't, so it got put in a separate net that then wasn't the official net that he was meant to be using. A complaint was put in about that. Anyway, it ended up that Stevie caught enough fish anyway, and he came second. Can't actually remember. I'm, I know Stevie will remember, but I'm, I can't actually remember. I think that eel didn't count, which cost Stevie winning his section. Um... But like I say, Stevie did, did brilliant anyway, second in his section. I had, at the end of the match, unbeknown to me, there was a complaint put in about me, about fishing um, with my bulk on the bottom, which the way we plumb up with a clip-on on the bottom shot was impossible. These commissionaire type blokes came down, told me I had to plumb up, put a plummet on the bottom shot, dropped my rig in and my float just sunk out of sight, which proved that my bulk wasn't on bottom. Took my rig off. Then they accused me of overshotting. So I had to put the rig back on, move the float down, drop it in the edge, and it sat there nice and proud, whole bristle out, no problem. Um, afterwards, obviously, the celebrations and that that we've got. I've got a few clippings here. Um, you can see there a picture of Stevie on Mark Downs' shoulders. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've got a few other pictures here. I just want to... Okay, Stu Conroy, um, there was one picture here, this one there, you can see that's me playing that eel that Mark Eaves famously still says this day he caught me, the Darwin 410 bent, absolutely double, giving it maximum beam so to speak, um, and you can see there that's another picture, that just shows you the sort of the banks on the river Seine. And those long green nets, just to make sure that you got your, if you did catch any fish in the water. But like I say, it was, it was, it was unfortunate the sort of controversy that surrounded the event to 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 an extent. But it since transpires that it wasn't the French team, it wasn't the French management. It was basically some sort of Klingons of the French team that that decided that. You know, under no uncertain terms are England meant to win this event here in Paris, in the home of, you know, continental style match fishing. You know, so, if, you know, it sort of took the shine off it for a few seconds for me. But um, fantastic, fantastic result. I've got another picture here that I'm going to take my time and find because this is probably one of the best pictures I've got in my memorabilia I don't think it'll ever be repeated so you can imagine we've won the world championships in Paris and what a picture that is and if you can see that there where my finger is there that is the Eiffel Tower so we're actually at the base of the Eiffel Tower for the presentation um, the relief from that to to not only win but to tackle a very very difficult venue where I said above all when you hooked a fish and caught a fish landed a fish it was a sense of achievement brilliant brilliant times I learned so so much about river fishing feeding plumbing up and everything brilliant brilliant team effort um, and like I say it, it was just really an experience of, of a lifetime in a place that you would never think that you'd probably match fish so I hope you like this edition of, of Match Memories and the 2001 World Championships in Paris. The next one I'm going to do will be the 2008 um, World Championships in Spinadesco in Italy, which was again was a very, very good year for the England team. Um, I don't want you to think that I'm just picking the ones where the team's done well and people have done well individually because there have been some bad ones along the way. Um, but Rather than dwell on the bad ones, I'd like to, to give you an insight into the stories, you know, backstage sort of thing, what actually happened in the team and, and the preparation and the tactics and the sort of thinking behind it all. Uh, thank you all for the, your comments. Um, the Match Memory series seems to be going down really well. Uh, I just want to end on wishing you all the best. Hope you're all keeping well. And I will see you on the bank definitely very soon. Bye-bye.